I'm Renee Barger, Associate Vice Chancellor for the Health Sciences Library System, better known as HSLS. Our library offers support and collaboration for the university's six schools of the health sciences. In this inclusive environment, we offer a wide array of information services, educational opportunities, and resources in print and electronic format. Our virtual and online services are featured on the HSLS website, and our physical home of Falk Library provides spaces to study, collections and exhibits to engage our visitors, and day-to-day -day support for questions and assistance within the health sciences community. It is my privilege to introduce you to our featured historical collections from our rare books room. The rare books and special collections at HSLS consist of more than 10,000 medical texts and artifacts published as early as 1496, as well as print and audiovisual materials of local interest, which span more recent decades. Founded in 1883 in conjunction with the Chartering of Pitt School of Medicine, the library's collection began with contributions from the first faculty members of the school and has grown to feature an international array of sought source materials. Today's historical collection, housed in Falk Library at Scaife Hall on Pitt's Oakland campus, brings together rare books from the former libraries of Pitt's Schools of Medicine, Dental Medicine, Graduate School of Public Health, Nursing, Pharmacy, and the UPMC Western Psychiatric Institute and Clinic. The collection does not normally purchase new artifacts, but donations of private collections have contributed to the continued growth of this unique collection. The collection is available to students and faculty, as well as the public by appointment. In 2019, a new space was created in Falk Library to house the collection and ensure the preservation and longevity of the materials it contains. Dr. Gosha Fort, Head of Digital Resource Development, manages the organization, access, and preservation for rare book and special collections. In her role, she also oversees web-based and digital projects, which increase the visibility of library historical collections. Gosha has been a part of HSLS for over 20 years and frequently shares collection highlights with the Pitt community through the HSLS Update newsletter. Today, she will be featuring select items from the collection rarely seen by the public. We hope you enjoy this episode of Medical Treasures of the Health Sciences Library System. Episode 5, Medical Classics. Classics are books which are must-haves for library collections. Without them, the collection would be lacking. For medical classics, they offers are to history of medicine what influences are to social media. Their works shaped the discipline and enhance our knowledge. They educated and guided generations of physicians. They represent a stepping stone, a breakthrough, or a canon to follow in medicine. Simply put, they are important to the history of medicine. The books we are going to look at today come from such a list of important medical classics. Hippocrates coi medicorum omnium sine controversia principis aphorismorum sectionis septem, published in Paris, 1545. Hippocrates was a Greek physician from Kos, who lived during the classical period in Greece and who laid the foundation for a medical practice and ethics. There is nothing I could say about Hippocrates uh, which would not sound trivial, yet he needs to be mentioned since the works and teachings of Hippocrates and his followers were guiding generations of physicians for 2,000 years, even before printed Latin edition allowed for wider dissemination of his medical wisdom. He coined a new term when he wrote his aphorisms around 400 BC. His succinct sayings on disease, diagnosis, and the art of healing represent the gold standard for medical wisdom 
in the Western world. Aphorisms were a perfect medium. He needed to compress knowledge into a form that allowed it to be easily remembered and passed on. Aphorisms have a poetic quality. They use persuasive power of poetry and mnemonic useful, usefulness of the verse for the benefit of the reader. Even today, there are voices advocated, advocating for the use of aphorisms in the medical teaching. If modern teachers can create such pearls of wisdom as Hippocrates did, involving imaginary humor, allusion, rhyme, and double meaning to make them aesthetically memorable and persuasive, they would have a powerful teaching tool. We are looking at the Latin edition of aphorisms with Galen's commentaries, prepared by Leonard Fuchs and published in Paris in 1545. Each Greek aphorism is followed by the Latin translation and discussion explaining in greater detail its meaning, followed by Galen's commentary. Many books I've shown in the series are in almost perfect condition, but today I selected the book in poor shape on purpose, so we can ponder on the passage of time. 2,400 years passed since it was written, and 450 years since this copy was printed. The limp vellum cover is very dirty and damaged by time. The binding, cords and ties are missing. The spine is broken and the cover is attached to the text block only on one side, exposing the sewing of the signatures and a very interesting liner of the spine. The binder used an old rubricated manuscript to reinforce the spine. Using a red color for beginning letters or emphasis was quite common in religious texts, but this piece is too small for me to tell whether this particular scrap is from an old Bible or not. The book has also a later 19th century note in French with possibly a name of uh, the owner. There's also some writing on the edge, but it is not legible anymore. The handwritten annotation prove that it was a well-studied copy. Claudi Galeni Pergameni Omnia, Basel, 1562. Claudius Galenus, known as Galen, the Greek physician and philosopher from the 2nd century AD, was the ultimate authority on anything related to medicine for more than 1500 years. He synthesized the works of his predecessors and promoted the Hippocratean theory of humors. He th thought that it was vital to study organs and body parts in order to understand their functions. He was considered a brilliant anatomist, though he could perform only animal dissections. His work on human cadavers was forbidden by Roman law. He was a prolific author and his works were disseminated in Greek, Arabic and Latin. His teachings were studied and followed without serious criticism for centuries. It was not until Galen, translator, and Vesalius published the Humani Corporis Fabrica in 1543 that his 15th century supremacy in anatomy ended and Vesalius became the the anatomist to follow. This Latin edition of Claudi Galeni Pergameni Omnia includes writings grouped in, into seven sections in which Galen discusses human nature and physiology, 
hygiene, etiology, symptoms and prognosis, pharmacy and preparations, blood and bloodletting, and under therapeutics, anything else related to practicing the profession. It is bound in elaborately decorated, blind, tooled, 16th century big skin binding with Emperor Rudolf II portrait in the center, surrounded by the heads of famous men of science. Gilded elements and spine label were added in 18th century. It includes numerous woodcuts decorations at the beginning of each chapter, so-called headpieces, and ornamental initials. It has many handwritten annotations, marks, and signatures of previous owners. Annotations are mostly in Latin, which is a strong indication they must have been early when Latin was still the language of science. The provenance of this book fascinates me. There is no evidence to point who was the first owner of the book. However, I want to believe that early on this book belonged to one of the physicians on scientists from Emperor Rudolf's circle in Prague, especially since the emperor's portrait was added to the binding. To narrow it down further, it would need to be someone who was still active when Francisco Valles' work on fevers was published in 1592, because the annotations make references to Valles' common palace. Out of those individuals, the most likely candidate is Johann Yesenius. The heavy annotations in the section on bones and multiple references to Fallopius works correspond to medical interest of Eusenius. This is just a guess, but it is certain that in the 18th century this copy belonged to Bole Willem Waxdorf, Danish poet, historian, civil servant, and book collector. His signature and his super ex libris, elephant brandishing arrows in a coronet, gilded on the front cover a prominent. His library was sold at auction after his death. The book ended up in the Bibliotheca Communitatis Regie in Copenhagen. The gilt initials BCR and Luxdorf super ex libris were probably added at that time. The books stayed there until the library was partially sold in 1853. The signature Gosh 1853 offers some possible explanations how the book ended up in London. Christian Karl August Gosh was a Danish zoologist, political and scientific writer. He acquired the book and took it with him when he moved to England, where he was a titular attaché to Danish embassy in London in the years 1862 to 1906. Finally, it is documented that the London bookseller Quaritch sold it to Mrs. James Heard in 1915. The letter from the seller reveals that the books were too heavy to be sent by a parcel service. They were shipped to Quaritch's agent in New York and from there delivered to Pittsburgh. Donated to the Falk Library by Dr. James Hertz Ayers, Galen's work weighed in the rare book room for an inquisitive user. Aureli Corneli Celsi Remedica, Leiden, 1592. Aulus Cornelius Celsus, active in the first century AD, was a Roman encyclopedist, mostly known for his work, the Medicina, the best source of medical knowledge of the period, discussing diet, pharmacology, and surgery. 
Most likely it was a part of much larger encyclopedic work. Not much is known about Celsus. We have only approximate life dates. We do not have certainty as to his first and middle names, and we do not even know whether he practiced medicine. From his writing style, we infer that he was highly educated patrician inspired by works of Hippocrates. He is called the Latin Hippocrates, or the Cicero of Doctors. His book was written for a layman. It gained popularity in an influence in the 15th century when it was rediscovered and printed in 1478. In print, it preceded the works of Hippocrates and Galen. This remarkable book, complete, well organized, clear, and concise, was studied by many famous physicians. It maintained popularity among medical classics until 19th century. The chapters on surgery are fundamentally a first printed surgery textbook. They give very instructional descriptions of procedures and insight into the astonishingly high standards of surgical knowledge which suggests he might have some medical practice. Uh, he wrote about the control of hemorrhage by ligature of vessels 15 centuries before Paré advocated it. And the symptomatic definition of inflammation he offered as rubor et tumor cum calore dolore redness and swelling with heat and pain is still valid. There is a lot written about his contributions to dermatology, plastic and eyelid surgery and neurosurgery. He was the, the inventor of scalpel with changeable blades and innovator of the trifine. Some of his surgical advices were followed for nearly two millennia. The copy we have is stored in a face box with extra filler to prevent unnecessary movement of the book, since the box was made wider to accommodate the warped cover. The book must have not uh, enough moisture and the dry leather shrank, causing the board wall. The paper is also brown in several places and the title page is dirty with uneven edges and a hole, showing some signs of former repairs. The book has only two illustrations and some handwritten annotations and references to another renowned Roman medical writer, Celius Aurelius. The text block is still in a very good shape. The Livre de la Chirurgie, Paris, 1564. Ambroise Paré was a French barber surgeon, one of the fathers of surgery, and a pioneer of many surgical techniques and battlefield wound treatments. Barber surgeons did not have the same high rank as physicians, but they had already been incorporated into the educational system of the University of Paris when Paré joined the Hôtel Dieu Hospital. They could attend lectures in anatomy and surgery and take master barber's examinations. Knowledge of Latin was required, but Paré got an exemption from being examined in Latin. He did not know the language and was made master without loud protests from the university physicians. He was that good. 
Pare was a surgeon for the army and spent his life serving the army during wartime and tending to the sick and poor in the time of peace. He was a surgeon to several French kings and he authored 10 books on anatomy, surgery and wound treatment. In his work, De Livre, he described the method of using blood as a ligation in amputations. Paré promoted it in favor of a widely used cauterization, which he recommended himself in his earlier book. He met with a lot of resentment from physicians for it, and it took several years before the vessel ligation method was uh, widely accepted and cauterization was abandoned. He invented or improved several surgical instruments, such as bullet forceps and trepan. As an innovator, he liked to try new things. He designed several artificial limbs, including a mechanical hand operated by catches and springs and an artificial eye. The book has a modern red full Morocco binding with gilt edges, wide gold tooled interior lace, and beautiful marble and papers, and the ribbed spine. It is signed inside front cover by Marcel Godillot, a French bookbinder active in the years 1938 to 1975. Then Cao Gangmu, Jingchang, 1784. Li Xinchan was Chinese herbalist, physician and writer during the Ming Dynasty. It took him years to collect all the information included in this encyclopedia and write it from exploring existing literature through many travels to interview healers and collect specimens to experimenting with medical uses on himself. He introduced a new system of classification, corrected mistakes from previous works on the nature of herbs and illnesses, included alternative names, descriptions and uses, explain main indications and effects, and gave prescriptions with dosages. Unfortunately, he did not live to see his book published. He died in 1593, three years before the book appeared in print. The result of his enormous effort is a massive work consisting of 48 books in six cases, and including close to 2,000 entries, 1,000 illustrations, and 11,000 prescriptions recognizing the use of iron in anemia or arsenic for skin diseases and fevers, for instance, and many other drugs with the same uses as today. We are looking at the 18th century reprint of Pentsalganmu, also known as the Compendium of Materia Medica, written during the Ming Dynasty. The original 1596 edition is regarded as the most complete and comprehensive medical book ever written on the history of traditional Chinese medicine. It lists all of the plants, animals, minerals, and other items that were believed to have medicinal properties. It is so much more than pharmaceutical text, for it covers also topics in biology, geography, mineralogy, and geology. It was translated to 20 languages, and it is still available in print and used today. All of the books are illustrated. 
they are all also examples of traditional woodblock printing. This method was developed in China for printing on silk rather than paper. And it is better suited for Chinese character set than movable type. The books are thread bound, a pro predominant binding format in traditional Chinese box, and they are enclosed in a cloth covered cases which are enforced with wooden boards and closed with loops and pegs. They were donated by Lieutenant Colonel J. A. Mendelssohn, a veteran of the First World War, who was a member of the United States military mission to China, and at one time an assistant professor of military science and tactics at the University of Pittsburgh. During his years in China, Burma, and India, he collected interesting objects related to the cultures of the countries where he served. He presented five early Chinese books to the library in the summer of 1944, Ben Cao Ganmu among them. These classical books are part of the vast historical collection at the Health Sciences Library system. It has been my pleasure to present this virtual series to you. If you have any questions, please contact me at gosia at pitt.edu or visit our website hsls.edu. P-I-T-T dot E-D-U.